Most Canadians are understandably under the impression that Canada is letting in about 500,000 immigrants a year. After all, Canada's 2023 to 2025 immigration levels plan states that in 2023, this year, we will be letting in 465,000 immigrants. In 2024, the government will raise that to 485,000, and then in 2025, it will be 500,000. The government brags that in 2022, last year, we let in a historic number of 431,645 newcomers. However, I came across a fantastic Epoch Times article written by Bill Tufts that outlines why these numbers are misleading and inaccurate. That rough 500,000 immigrants number only refers to how many permanent residents are being allowed in. When we account for non-permanent residents, the real 2022 number is actually more like 955,000. We also need to account for international students, refugees, illegal immigrants, and temporary foreign workers, all of whom are accessing our housing supply, medical system, schools, and other resources like food banks. I mean, as an aside, in some cases, non-Canadians actually make up the majority of people using some Canadian food banks. And as per a CBC article, 80% of the people using the Surrey Food Bank in BC have a Muslim background. Let's bring up some other relevant facts from the official Government of Canada website. During the 2021 census, nearly one in four people counted were or had been a landed immigrant or permanent resident in Canada, the highest proportion since Confederation and the largest proportion among G7 countries. Also, immigration accounts for almost 100% of Canada's labor force growth, and by 2032, it's projected to account for 100% of Canada's population growth. So all that is to say, a lot of Canadians may have the idea in their head that we're getting 450 to 500,000 immigrants a year, but now we know that is actually only half of the reality. And all this is happening in the context of a housing crisis and a healthcare system breakdown. On the housing front, the average national price of a rental in Canada is just over $2,000 a month. Uh, so what, from what I understand, that includes all size units in all cities. Of course, if you're getting a two bedroom in Vancouver or Toronto, it's gonna be much, much higher than $2,000. In Canada, you know, Canadian culture, if you will, if you hoard properties and rent them out, you are thought of as a savvy individual rather than just greedy. People in this country know that if they buy properties, there will always be a stream of new immigrants to rent to. So Canadians will buy rental properties as investments and non-Canadians will buy properties as investments as well. And they'll see that housing as an investment rather than seeing a home or a shelter for a fellow human being. Also, yes, zoning and supply. Lots of people talk about how we need to build more housing stock. And Prime Minister Justin Trudeau himself said at an appearance in Ontario earlier this month, there's a labor shortage in the construction industry and building houses. So as we bring in more people who can build houses, we will solve some of the housing shortage. So that's his big brain plan, is to bring in more immigrant construction workers to build houses for all of the immigrants that he's bringing in. Uh, on the healthcare front in Canada, there are simply not enough doctors to go around, and so people end up having to go to the emergency room to be seen for what they need to be seen for. But then the emergency room is overcrowded and so on. For the state of walk-in clinics, if your city even has a functioning walk-in clinic, oftentimes you have to line up before it even opens, and then, you know, by half an hour later that morning, they fill up their quota, and then they lock their doors for the rest of the day. Now, I am absolutely not blaming immigrants for all of Canada's problems, so don't take it that way. But what I am saying is, let's see what would happen if we just stopped immigration for three years like around three years. Imagine the 2023 to 2025 immigration plan was zero or 
perhaps 5,000 people a year. Would everything really crash and burn if we did that? Because I don't think so. If you think I'm being naive, then, you know, argue with me in the comment section by all means. But what if we actually saw a slight improvement in the delivery of services? What if we actually saw a more balanced rental and housing market? And by the way, I'm just referring to permanent residents. I'm not talking about refugees. That's a separate thing. And honestly, I'm not completely sure how the international student system works in Canada. So I, um, maybe universities have a cap on the international students that they're allowed to admit. Uh, I'm not sure. So that's a topic for another day. Uh, because of course, international students, there's a lot of them in Canada. They need rentals as well. They're also occupying dorm rooms. And universities want lots of international students because their tuition rates are higher. And then separate but related is these fake strip mall colleges that are exist as immigration pathways. Now, I am talking about all this because I have noticed a shift in the discourse, and maybe you've noticed it too. It used to be that any argument for lowering immigration would get you labeled a racist, and it was beyond the scope of polite conversation in the spheres of media, academia, government, so on. But now I don't think that is the case. And I think we are right on the cusp, like right on the edge of this kind of anti-immigration sentiment being socially acceptable to express. And it is the strain on Canadian resources that is making this anti-immigration sentiment more socially acceptable. And of course, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about being anti-immigrant. I'm not saying yell slurs and go spit on a woman wearing a hijab. I'm talking about anti-immigration policy. And let me be clear, at this point in the game, it's only acceptable from the standpoint of talking about resources. It's only acceptable to be um, anti-immigration from the standpoint of resources. So talking about our strained healthcare system, our overcapacity K-12 classrooms, um, our housing crisis. It's still not socially acceptable in polite society to talk about the cultural changes Canada has been and will experience due to immigration. And that's too complex of a topic for me to cover in this video, but I will say, you can't let in nearly a million new people every year who are mostly not white uh, and then have job postings in Canada that favor non-white people and openly discriminate against white skin, especially in the context of this diversity and inclusion apparatus. I mean, we even have a federal minister of diversity and inclusion, which actually means, you know, discriminate against white people. So, I mean, they are doing this. This is what the Canada, what this is what is happening in Canada. It's ridiculous. But I think the day might come where people push back against that. But we will probably be waiting several years for that to happen for people to catch up. But anyways, the idea of an immigration moratorium is not new, but this is a new time to be calling for one because so many Canadians are deeply unhappy with the resource strain in this country. So we've talked about what the immigration numbers look like in Canada, but now let's talk about why we're seeing what the government itself touts as record-breakingly high levels of immigration. In a nutshell, many will answer that Canada has an aging population, Canadians are not having babies, so we need more workers, and we have a labor shortage. Let's reflect on that. Is there a labor shortage? Are there really no Canadian-born people available to work in this country? Or not enough? Um, or is it that Canadians don't want to work for $16 an hour with no benefits um, when rent and utilities eat up half their income and they can't get a home close to their workplace, so they have to spend a fortune on gas, driving to work, commuting to work, because um, public transit in the smaller cities in this country, it's not functional enough to be timely and direct, so you have to drive. Um, then the remainder of your money goes to daycare and your kids' extracurriculars and your cell phone bill and debt repayment and groceries, and then that's it. So yeah, I can see why a lot of Canadians 
wouldn't want to live that way. But Bill Tufts notes in his Epoch Times article that Ottawa has never produced a definitive report on the labor shortage or aging worker crisis. So we actually don't know if this is a real problem that requires us to flood our economy and bring in hundreds of thousands of new people every year. Tufts also notes that a lot of retirement age people are actually still working because of high rent and high cost of living. Another great article in the Globe and Mail by David Green. I'm just going to read it out because it's great. Now, the main argument made to ramp up immigration is that it will spur economic growth. And this is a tantalizing promise that turns out not to be true. Study after study after study shows that sudden expansions in immigration increase the size of the economy, the GDP, but don't change GDP per person or the average wage, how well off people are. The research shows that immigration tends to lower wages for people who compete directly with the new immigrants, often previously arrived immigrants and low-skilled workers, and improves incomes for the higher skilled and business owners who get labor at lower wages. That is, this can be an inequality increasing policy. And there we go. What else is there to add to that? The author of this article also notes in regard to the housing crisis, the government's response to this most obvious of problems is that immigrant trades workers will fill shortages in construction trades, increasing housing production. But the construction sector isn't grinding to a halt because of lack of workers. Employment in the sector is already above 2019 levels, and there is plenty of activity. The problem in housing supply is rooted in municipal regulations around density and offshore buyers treating our housing as an investment. Okay. Unfortunately, that economist, David Green, ends off his article by saying that immigration is necessary and positive and it makes our lives more vibrant. And look, I have... I have nothing against immigrants personally. That should go without saying. If you are an immigrant watching this, this is not about you personally. This is about the flood of people. This is about the mass. This is about a high level that cannot be sustained. I get along very well with immigrants. Um, I'm married to a Romanian immigrant. And I guess, like, I don't feel the need to denigrate my own people, but... I think a lot of Canadians can be stuck up, yeah, and immigrants, by contrast, are often quite friendly and interesting, at least the ones I've interacted with, yeah. But that being said, I don't need immigrants to add colour and, like, save me from my boring, colourless, non-vibrant Canadian life, so um, that's a non-issue. For a long time, I have heard so many people try to deny that housing supply and resource strain, wage stagnation, and healthcare services are related to immigration levels. But there is a sort of critical mass of data and policy analysis coming in that is proving that these things are connected. And my takeaway from wading through all these reports and all this research is that we just need to slow this all down for a while. Let's just take a pause here. Let's give our immigration system a break. Let's recalibrate. And let's just think about this. Do we really need this high a level of new people coming in? In the past, overall, it's been kind of seen as the backwater, uninformed, uneducated position to be anti-immigration, to be wanting to lower immigration levels. But now... It's actually the more informed and educated position. Because when you look at the, the policy research, when you look at the analysis, the idea that we have a labor shortage is dubious. And so we really have to ask ourselves, how is it helpful to us as individual Canadians wanting to get by to be importing nearly a million people a year? That's something we need to ask ourselves.